collections that we curate, which happen to be my personal favorite. I don't know about you, but prior to working at an art museum, I had never really given much thought to all of the work that goes into what I see on the gallery walls when I visit. Today, we wanna to share some of those insights with you and introduce you to some of this behind the scenes professionals who bring our exhibitions to life. A museum preparator is a multifaceted position. As its name suggests, a preparator prepares our gallery spaces for exhibitions in addition to many other responsibilities. Today, we will introduce you to Kevin McGarry, the Frost Art Museum's talented preparator, who will provide his insights on installing the exhibition house to house. But before we introduce you to the man, the myth, the legend, we'd like to show you a brief video Kevin created that encompasses his work. Take a look. Thank you so much, Natasha, for starting us off right today as we celebrate the opening of House to House. Uh, and my name is Amy Galpin. I'm the chief curator at the Frost Art Museum. And without any further ado, uh, welcome, Kevin, to our VIP opening celebration. Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so just throw it back to Amy real quick. She can intro. We're going to go ahead and share some images of you of the behind the scenes process of house to house and Kevin, why don't you go ahead and start by sharing a little bit more about what a preparator does. Sure. Well, other than making short films like you saw, I'm formerly <laughs> trained as an artist in Philadelphia uh, before coming to Florida and I've worked here now for 10 years as an art technician the past two exclusively with the frost as the preparator. Um, short disclaimer that that movie you saw was really just something I made for fun when I had the opportunity to come back to the museum after the pandemic. And it's really just something to keep our team motivated uh, while we went into exhibition installs in such a tough time. Um, yes. As you see in the video, and as Natasha mentioned, I do have a long list of duties and responsibilities. Uh, to put it simply, I consider myself a steward of the arts. I take a certain care for these objects and a reverence in how I display them in our exhibitions. Um, some of my fondest personal memories are visiting museums and institutions as a child. And the magic and the wonderment that is experienced, I hope to try to deliver that same level of excitement to our community. Thank you, Kevin. It's such a pleasure to work with you uh, on each and every exhibition. Something that we talked about very early with House to House was having um, a wall of women. And in the process of the exhibition, we ended up sort of dividing that wall into two distinct spaces. Uh, you can see at the center um, of this wall of women is a photograph of 19 women who were elected to judge positions in Harris County uh, in 2018. And this photograph kind of went viral after the 2018 election. And while I was working on this show, it, it was one of the first images um, that I was drawn to, to include in the exhibition. Uh, but beyond the images that you're looking at on your screen, it was Kevin's idea to do the treatment that you see um, behind uh, the images that evokes wallpaper. Kevin, could you talk a little bit about this? 
For sure. Um, so when I first received the checklist, and the checklist for us is really just a list of all the images of the art that will be in the show and the dimensions. Uh, so I get a, a feeling for the size and the scale. Um, without House to House, the idea of the wallpaper immediately popped into my head and I was reminded of an important piece of feminist literature written in the late 1800s by Charlotte Perkins and it's called, wait for it, The Yellow Wallpaper. Not only is it ahead of its time, but its themes are central to the ideas of women taking control of their mental health and self-identity. Uh, the pattern that you see on the wall, it resembles the cover of that book and it's my personal homage to Perkins. Um, to use the element of wallpaper from a home and bring it into the art museum setting for me really transforms the space and gives it a softer feel as opposed to the white gallery walls that you would normally see when you enter. Uh, we want you to feel like you're entering a home. Now, practically speaking, we would not want to use wallpaper because of the glues and all the waters involved to apply it. So what you see is actually hand painted to give the effect. Thank you, Kevin. It's such a great uh, entry space as we walk into the exhibition. Carmen, could you go to the next slide, please? In sharing our kind of behind the scenes process, uh, something that Kevin and I go through are layouts. Um, they often start uh, with my sort of bad penmanship, writing on a post-it note or on a napkin, sort of an idea of, of a layout. Um, but then Kevin uses the program SketchUp that you're seeing on the left uh, to start working through these, these ideas. Kevin, could you share a little bit more about how you use SketchUp? And you don't have to share how many times we go through the layout, um, but I'll just say that it's many. <laughs> yes, this one had a, a few extra iterations because of the pandemic and working remotely. Um, it really changed the way that we work. You know, I have a highly physical job and it's very hands on. I'm a bit old school when I design things. So I take a lot of notes. I do a lot of drawings. Um, but we have many different methods from me using small physical models that I make or photoshopping art into uh, photos of the art into the space. Uh, SketchUp is a great program. It's computer-aided design, and I'm able to communicate all the ideas with our team remotely. Um, I've moved a lot of my drawings into SketchUp, and I feel it's working great to create digital renderings of how the exhibit will actually work in our space. Definitely. And I think the image on the right also gives our um, attendees today a sense of the prep that goes involved. You know, you're building cases um, and thinking about um, the works of art that will go on them. I'm often asking annoying questions like, will the platform hold the weight of the 1935 Magic Chef oven? Um, to which you're always very, very kind and calmly say, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I want to mention, I know some of the artists are in the show are, have signed on today. Um, I see that uh, Leonard Suryaya is with us, Rosemary Charlone. Um, in this image, we can see a very tiny uh, model of Peggy Nolan's work, as well as Jamila Sabor. Uh, and of course, Aurora Molina, who we'll, we'll be talking about in, in a little bit. Uh, Carmen, could we go to the next slide? Kevin and I wanted to share with you what it looks like. Um, so those images were kind of showing you the development. Uh, and this photograph was taken yesterday. If you look closely, you can see there's actually a label on the floor. Uh, this is um, us uh, doing the final touches along with our colleagues, Yadi, Lourdes, Ashley, and, and many others. Uh, Kevin, anything you want to say about this image? Sure. If you, if you saw the previous images, you'll see that once we get through our iterations, the computer design and the actual installation become very similar. Um, this really helps us when we go in to do the physical work, so there's not too many surprises, and we're prepared ahead of time um, to really directly place this art where it's going to go. Awesome. We could go to the next slide. One of the kind of curveballs of curveballs of this exhibition was the dollhouses. Um, it was a loan that was in process so that we were seeking before the pandemic began. Um, and we were really excited to be able to include 
um, dollhouses in, in the exhibition, thinking about um, the connection um, between childhood, nostalgia, desire. The dollhouses in the exhibition were actually made by a grandmother for, for her grandchildren. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, Kevin can talk a little bit about how he, how he dealt with the dollhouses. Yes, I love the dollhouses and you're, you're right. Um, these dollhouses are, are very playful and during what is usually a stressful time of the installations, they brought back a lot of joy. Um, not that the other art wasn't a joy to work with, but I've seen a lot of art and I've handled a lot of art. And it's something like seeing these dollhouses in person that'll really make you wonder, how did they do that? Um, it's really that sense of amazement that I still get that makes me love what I do because never before and never again will I install a three inch by three inch Cy Twombly. It's just amazing. Um, so you'll see in the pictures, in doing my research for the dollhouses, I was really inspired by the stories of how they came about. And in that same spirit, I went ahead and made our curatorial team a miniature tape measure and a level because when you're installing miniature art, you really need miniature tools. Uh, I hope you all really get to see these in person. They're amazing. Kevin referenced Cy Twombly, and in fact, that's his hand using a, the little tape measure that he built uh, to make sure that the Cy Twomblys are, are installed correctly. Um, these houses um, were built uh, in 1993 um, and in the, the Andrews family, and they were friendly with Cy Twombly. And he saw the uh, dollhouses in progress, and he said, you know, I think they need some art. Uh, so the family ended up commissioning a number of visual artists uh, to make these very tiny um, works like Julian Schnabel um, and Arturo Herrera. Um, my director uh, came up with the title of our exhibition, House to House, Women, Politics, and Place. And we were very early on thinking about the idea of dollhouses. And, and we're so grateful for these particular houses because they are, they are quite special. Um, and, you know, when you come to the museum, you'll see that they have a, a fireplace that lights up, um, a garden, um, and Kevin did an incredible job, uh, you know, organizing the installation, working closely with our registrar, Lourdes Renero, building the table um, to fit these, these dollhouses. One thing that um, Kevin and I are often doing is uh, working with living artists. Uh, so, Carmen, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So, uh, you're seeing two uh, very draft images here. Um, and the artists are, I know, on this um, program, they're probably chuckling to themselves, but uh, a tiny cell phone picture that I took of Rosemary's glass sculpture. Uh, when I first saw it. Um, and then on the back wall, um, you're seeing us drafting ideas of how we would install Aurora Molina's installation, Woven Destiny, that makes its debut in our exhibition. Uh, Kevin, do you want to talk a little bit um, about Aurora's installation? Yeah, for sure. These next few slides that you'll see, they'll show you how we use the SketchUp to breathe bring things to life. Um, they're a great example of that, and that's a big part of what I do personally, is bringing the vision to life. Um, we originally started in the layout, and all I had was that one image, and hearing that there'd be close to 100 objects on the wall, I just naturally went ahead and <clears throat> duplicated the image as many times as I could, so we'd get the, the understanding of the scale. Um, you know, when I first heard there'd be 100 objects installed on one wall, it felt a bit daunting to try to fit that into my schedule. And then Amy told me that the artist wanted to install them herself. And I thought that fit into my schedule perfectly. And I figured we could probably fit a lot more than 100 at that point. But I thought Aurora did a great job. It looks wonderful. Carmen, could you go to the next slide? Uh, so here you can see on the left, the progress, Aurora Molina is uh, supervising the install here. Um, and you can see all of the various components that are laid out on the table. There are 100 mandalas in the installation, many of which were made during collaborative uh, uh, workshops, uh, some by young students of Aurora, and there's even one by the Miami-based artist, uh, Laura Marsh. 
You also see in this image a really nice um, photograph of Rosemary Charlone's uh, sculpture uh, that features the poetry of Susan Weiner. Uh, and then behind her sculpture, you see some prints by the Gorilla Girls um, that the museum was able to acquire uh, in connection with this exhibition. And then also three prints on loan from our colleagues um, at the Wilsonian. I want to, I, Kevin, you're getting a lot of nice, nice comments and nice praise uh, from uh, Octavia uh, in the comments who's joined us and we're going to talk more with her in just a little bit. Also our former colleague, Tanya Alonso. But for all of you that are attending, we also uh, invite you to ask questions. Uh, feel free to write in the chat if you have questions for Kevin um, about his, his process. And then Carmen, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. And now here you see uh, this wonderful installation uh, by Aurora Molina titled Woven Destiny that's in our exhibition. And then over on the right, um, you see this is kind of the second iteration uh, of uh, Woven, I'm sorry, of the Wall of Women. Um, there's a photograph um, of Danica Rome, uh, who was the first transgender woman uh, to be elected to any state legislature. Uh, you have a little illustration that says votes for women that was made at the turn of the century. Uh, and then you have a photograph of three black women who are reviewing the voter logs uh, in Newark, New Jersey in 1957. Kevin, any, any other thoughts about House to House? And also maybe you could share, you mentioned it kind of briefly, but um, about how the pandemic, you know, shaped your work. I, I feel like that we kind of organized the installation uh, was much longer than normal. Um, and also you did most of the physical work yourself because we didn't want to add extra people into the room. This is true. Uh, coming to work back with the pandemic was at first a challenge to make sure we were following all the proper procedures. We want to be as safe as we can. Um, so that means I had to limit the labor and the amount of people that we brought in. A lot of the work was done myself uh, with the help of our team, Lourdes Raniero, Yadi, um, and Ashley Valenez. But yes, it was, it was challenging. We had to adapt. I think we did a great job. Um, one thing I would like to add in this, in this room that we don't get to see is Octavia Yearwood's piece, The Transform. Um, you can watch the whole series. I watched it all on YouTube. I encourage you to watch it and it will change you. Um, it's a great piece of art. Thank you, Kevin, so much for saying that. And we'll hear from Octavia um, in about 20, 20 minutes or so, a little bit less. Um, but it's, it's really a pleasure to, to work with Octavia and so many of the art and all of the artists, but so many of the artists we were able to talk to through this process. Um, and I have to say, you know, as a part of Natasha's vision for this event, um, she, you know, wanted um, Kevin to reveal all this behind the scene information. And I want to say that I love that Kevin is an artist um, and that he has a background in the visual arts because I think the way in which he approaches both the historic and contemporary art, um, he does so with such sensitivity and attention to detail. Um, and you know, it's one of the great pleasures uh, for us to also highlight um, living artists, to highlight artists in our community. Um, you know, I, I was speaking earlier this week with uh, Leonard Surajaya, again, who's featured in the exhibition with two photographs. Um, and, and we love having his work and with Catherine Opie, Deb Willis, Ramiro Gomez, um, and then also to have some, some of our uh, good friends like Rosemary Charlone. This is the second exhibition that she's been featured in in recent times uh, at the uh, Frost. She was in Spheres of Meaning, um, a, an exhibition that focused on artist books and now, of course, in, in House to House. Kevin, anything you want to add before we um, say farewell? 
Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to be able to share what I do with you all. Um, I hope that you visit institutions as, as much as you can, as safely as you can. I hope to see you all soon, and I hope you get a chance to see this exhibit in person. It's, it's really powerful. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you to the entire curatorial team who worked um, on the installation of this exhibition and, and was able to do so uh, safely. Uh, Kevin, looks like you're getting lots of praise again in the, in the chat. Um, so thank you. And, and I also want to echo what Natasha said at the beginning today that we are open again. Uh, so you can come see the exhibition in person. Uh, we are open on Fridays and Saturdays by appointment into the FIU community Wednesday through Saturday. But if you're not ready, we will be doing another virtual tour uh, of this exhibition. So keep in touch with us as soon as the virtual tour is ready. We'll be posting it uh, on our website. Well, um, we're going to transition uh, into the second part of our opening. Those of you who attended this part of the program got a little sneak peek, um, but we will be starting to uh, move over to Facebook uh, shortly. Those of you who are here, you can stay here, um, but we're gonna have some other people join us over on Facebook and we'll hear some remarks from our director, Jordana Pomeroy. Uh, we'll also hear from two young FIU alum and my colleague, Mariana Ramirez, and then also Octavia Yearwood and a special video message from DJ Tracy Young. Uh, so just bear with us for a few minutes and we'll, we'll start back up. Thank you. Welcome everybody. I just got the cue to begin. It's so strange to uh, still be working at home and I'm really proud of my team for choreographing um, our openings as well as our programming and exhibitions uh, remotely and digitally. So thank you everybody. My name is Jordana Pomeroy. I'm the director of the Frost Art Museum at Florida International University. Um, thanks for coming to our opening today for House to House Women, Politics and Place. I wanna start with a quotation that is on our walls right now. Uh, as something written by the feminist author, Rebecca Solnit. This is what we mean by democracy, that everyone has a voice, that no one gets away with things just because of their wealth, power, race, or gender. And if that doesn't get you wanting to come to the museum, I don't know what else will. We have, um, this exhibition is, fabulous. Um, it is uh, very timely um, in many ways as the US as US citizens will go to the polls uh, to cast their vote in the 2020 presidential elections uh, shortly and um, shortly after the death of legendary uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Little did we know how um, timely this exhibition opening would be. Um, I want to start by thanking our primary sponsor, the Funding Arts Network here in Florida for supporting this exhibition and their commitment to helping arts organizations across Miami. 
I am also uh, grateful to all the members of the Frost Art Museum for their continuing support of our work, um, which always has been, which was a worry for many arts organizations across the nation that uh, our members would forget us, but actually quite the opposite. Everybody has, uh, we, we've seen our member roles um, uh, stay steady and we, we really are grateful uh, for your uh, loyalty and your confidence in our work. Um, we just gave our members a benefit, which was a behind the scenes look of the development and installation of House to House. And if you would like to join us on uh, your future exclusive events, you can sign up for a membership. Uh, Kevin is our preparator, if you didn't figure that out already. And if you didn't see this video, it really, I mean, brought a smile to my face. He's full of energy. Uh, in some ways, I, when I was a curator, I found that uh, the installation of an exhibition was uh, in some ways the most exciting part of the uh, entire deal. Um, I was uh, uh, very delighted to see this video. Um, I would also like to recognize a few of our generous lenders to the exhibition, including Francie Bishop Good and David Horwitz, David and Zane Stern, uh, Martin Z. Margulies, otherwise known as Marty Margulies, Lucy and Douglas Andrews, and Sarah Steinbaum. Thank you so much for lending uh, your works uh, from your collections. I know it's, um, they're like your babies, so we appreciate. And we're, since we are extending this exhibition through February, we are truly appreciative that you will let go of these for an additional month. I would also like to recognize the amazing work of our curatorial team, um, Amy Galpin, uh, Lourdes Renero, Ashley Balinas, Kevin McGarry, Yadi Rivero, and of course, um, you um, did hear from Amy if you were a member. And again, I urge you to, uh, to become a member so you can have um, her uh, scholarly and uh, her scholarly expertise. I would like uh, now to um, welcome Mariana Ramirez. And I'm just being reminded um, before Mariana comes on to please do go to our website to see how you can visit the Frost Art Museum. And I truly urge you to do so. This comes from, uh, this is a personal um, invitation. We know that it is, a, it is very hard for people to think about going out and going inside. Uh, we have been extremely careful. The museum is full of Purell and we won't allow more than 25 visitors at a time. We are open to the public Fridays and Saturdays from 10 to three. Uh, you have to make an appointment so uh, there's plenty of space and air to breathe. You know our beautiful building is, we're very fortunate. It's very open, it's very contemporary, um, and it is very hygienic. Uh, so not to see this will be a, um, would be a, um, a real miss if you can't come here in person. So please do try to make an appointment and, and do come and uh, see this, uh, this exhibition. We have actually, we have, uh, the art is full. I mean, the museum is full of art, so um uh do come in person and with that i will introduce our manager of strategic initiatives mariana ramirez hello everyone i'm so pleased today to be joined by stephanie marcellos and gabriela hernandez both of them graduated from fiu in 2019 and are currently working on the women's suffrage centennial commission which was formed to commemorate and coordinate the nationwide celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th amendment Stephanie earned her bachelor's degree in communication and media studies and is currently working as the communications and program specialist for the commission. Gabriella earned her degree in political science and international relations and is serving as the program coordinator for the commission. They were both Washington DC based interns affiliated with FIU in Washington's DC talent lab program prior to landing their full-time roles with the commission. Uh, Gabriella and Stephanie, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. It's always great to come back and do FIU things and seeing FIU faces, so thank you. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I, for my first question, could you tell us a little bit what about the we, uh, Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission? What is it about? Sure, sure. So the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission is a federal commission that was created by Congress in 2017. Uh, so just for some perspective, the US has had over 150 federal commissions uh, created by Congress, um, each with their own specific purpose and role that is written into their legislation. 
And for us, our role was to celebrate and commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and women's right to vote. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so now I'd love if, could each of you um, tell us what was unique about the commission uh, for you? Um, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the commission itself is so unique because this moment in history that we get to be a part of, you know, this is a huge milestone in American democracy and um, it's, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, I personally don't plan to be around for the bicentennial. So, um, you know, this having the chance to not only be a part of these centennial celebrations, but actually be a part of the planning of them and being able to have a say in, you know, how we're commemorating women's right to vote um, is huge and has been such, I'm just so grateful for this experience and it's been um, quite a roller coaster. It's been um, complex, inspiring, dramatic, much like the suffrage movement itself. Um, so that just, being able to to serve on this commission has just in and of itself been really unique for me personally. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I just, everything that Stephanie said, I agree with. Um, for me, I think one of the most special moments or one of the most uh, special things or unique aspects of the commission uh, for me was being a Cuban American, I, I have the blessing of being bilingual in both English and Spanish. Um, and a goal that I personally have everywhere that I've worked is to, to use that blessing, to use being bilingual in my work. Uh, and I was able to do that. I was given more than enough space and time to actually make some of our programs both bilingual in English and Spanish. Um, and, you know, not just for the sake of having something in Spanish, but to expand the reach of the history that we're trying to teach. Because I think that what we realized was that the history of women, women's history is not common. It's not the, it's, it's not included that much in our history books. It's not mainstream. So I think that making it accessible in as many languages or in as many formats as we could uh, played a big role in making it accessible to every American. Great, thank you both. Um, could you each tell me um, about a highlight during your time with the commission? So there's been so many highlights. Um, we've we've done so much, but I think a personal favorite for me, um, one of my many uh, tasks tasks with the commission is um, overseeing our online store, um, which is called the Suff Shop, which is kind of cheesy, but you know. Um, and I got to help develop some of the products that we have. And um, my personal favorite is um, I was scrolling through Pinterest one day and I came across this artist. And she, uh, I guess, uh, has these illustrations of different um, women and alongside it is this, you know, sort of empowering word. Um, and they're nice, they're bright, they're colorful, they're color colorful, excuse me, they're super um, inspiring. And I just immediately fell in love with them. And I thought, you know, this would make a really cool, um, you know, potential product on our web store. I'd love to do a suffragist series with her. I think that would be um, very unique and, and original to have. So I tracked down the artist, got in touch with her. She, she said yes. Um, and I got to pick the women that we featured and the word that accompanied them, which to me was, you know, it was actually really tough because um, suffrage history is very rich and deep. And there's so many women, you know, I think a lot of times we're kind of, we just know Susan B. Anthony and maybe Elizabeth Cady Stanton and that's kind of it. But there were thousands of other women. So um, to have to narrow it down to 26 was really hard, but um, I loved it. And the final product, I could not be more proud of. Um, they look fantastic. Of course, I, I, might, I might be a little biased, but um, getting to pick uh, their, their words and the women that we featured and making sure, uh, most importantly, that a diverse group of women was highlighted was really important to me and um, is something that, you know, I'll be forever proud of and making sure that you know, these women, that they're, that they get remembered and, and what they did for all of womankind from, you know, that point on um, gets remembered and their stories get told. So um, that to me, I think was one of my favorite highlights. So um, yeah, definitely check it out if you guys get the chance. They're really, really uh, great pieces of art. Very cool. Yeah, we put it in the, uh, in the chat as well. Awesome. So, um, so people can, can see what you worked on. And Gabriella, what about you? What was a highlight for you? 
Yeah, of course. I actually want to point out that mine is also another uh, uh, art project of ours. Um, and I think it just, you know, it, it represents just so much about how these exhibits are essential to tell these stories. And I think that it just draws the parallel, whether it was what we did or what the Frost is doing with the house to house exhibit. It just exemplifies how important it is not only to have the, these stories in textbooks and in, and in literature, but to have them in person and be able to interact with them. So for me, one of the highlights of working with the commission was our um, nationwide illumination campaign called Forward Into Light. Uh, and Forward Into Light comes from a suffrage slogan, Forward Through the Darkness, Forward Into Light. And we had a, the very small goal of illuminating the entire US in the suffrage colors of purple and gold. Um, I didn't realize it at the moment as to what a large project I was working on. It was very much the day-to-day -day contact everyone, contact offices, contact buildings, companies, and you know, just go on and go forth with it. Uh, to make a long story short, on August 26, which was the day that the 19th Amendment was actually added into the Constitution, on August 26, 2020, we had over 500 sites across the country and in territories illuminate in purple and gold to honor the suffragists. Um, I get chills <laughs> just talking about it, uh, but that was definitely one of the most rewarding and one of, one of the things that I, I'll remember for the rest of my life. Um, we had sites all the way from Niagara Falls to the St. Louis Arches to uh, the Empire State Building and even in Florida. We had the Hard Rock Guitar Hotel, which you might all be familiar with. We had the Freedom Tower, which means a lot to me. Um, so yeah, I think that that was one of the many highlights. Uh, and just another reminder that public art plays a special role when we tell these stories. So I just admire so much what you are all doing um, and the work that you all have put into this exhibit. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Actually, we have a question. Uh, will the commission continue after the centennial year or does it, do you have a hard end date? So the commission itself sunsets in December. Um, as per our legislation, we were only created for you know, a short amount of time uh, for the, you know, the centennial. Um, but a lot of our projects will continue to live on. We have, um, as Gabby said, public art is very important and a lot of our projects will live on through public art. We have different statues and murals that will be um, going up um, around the country and they'll be there forever. So um, if you visit womensvote100.org, you can check out all our different programs and projects. So um, yeah, we definitely have a lot. So we have some legacy projects that will live on, but in, in terms of you know us, the staff um, and the commission itself, we will be sadly closing out in December of this year. Well, thank you so much. Um, just so our audience knows, there were only six full-time staffers on this commission, and Gabriella and Stephanie are two of them, so they have done FIU Proud, Miami Proud. We are so happy to have you as part of our FIU community. Um, thank you both so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it, and we'll put some more information in the chat um, on how to find out about this, uh, about your program, so thank you both so much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce my um, friend and colleague, Amy Galpin, um, who's going to take us into our next part of the program. Thank you so much, Mariana. That was really a special conversation with Gabriela and Stephanie, and I agree they've made FIU very proud. I'm grateful to our colleagues in FIU Government Relations for tipping us off on their uh, wonderful um, success. I, I want to turn it back a little bit to the exhibition, uh, House to House, Women, Politics, and Place. You know, when you come and see the exhibition or if you check it out online, I think what you're going to see is, is the relationship between um, women and specific places, you know, whether that's the home, the factory, the beauty shop. Uh, as we go to the polls this fall um, with the recent um, beginning of the Me Too movement, with the continued debate and changes around Title IX, uh, it seems like a great moment to think about women um, and their relationship to place um, and, and to politics. Last year, I had the great pleasure of hearing uh, Octavia Yearwood speak at our museum. Uh, we invited her to give an afternoon talk. Uh, many students attended, as did our staff. Um, and, and in particular, I remember several students saying that they felt 
transformed by the experience um, of hearing from Octavia Yearwood, uh, who is an artist, uh, writer, choreographer, and curator uh, based here in, in Miami. Octavia said something uh, during her talk uh, that she was working on a documentary uh, on a black trans women living here in Miami. And I, you know, my, my ears really perked up because I thought, you know, this is a really essential project, um, especially given the disproportionate violence um, against uh, black trans women. And, and I wanted to know more. And so I'm really thrilled that when you come to House to House, part of the exhibition is one of the episodes um, of Octavia's project, the documentary series Transforum. Uh, so welcome, Octavia. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Amy. Thank you for mm -hmm. having me, FIU. It's always a pleasure. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what compelled you? What were the ideas that made you say, I, I want to make Transforum? Uh, so for me, my practice as an artist is to pay attention, to feel, to empathize, to have compassion, and to create. So for me, uh, it was me looking at the world. It was me being in spaces. At the time, I had gotten into a fellowship with Song. They're, they're mostly known. They're known a lot for their uh, bailout initiatives to stop money bail, and they're also known for their Black Mama bailouts, where they raise funds over the year to bail out Black mamas who have been in jail as a result of just not being able to pay for bail, and. Um, and they let them out, they, they get this money to put them out on Mother's Day. And so whenever I was in the space for this fellowship, it seemed as though last year, there was always this moment where there was news within that time frame where another black trans woman was killed. And I would just see how the entire room just was blanketed in sadness. It was thick, it was like, but you know, the, iron, the ironic part was like, it was like the way the world felt when George Floyd was killed that kind of sort of that just thing that just happened and it just went global. That thing happened in the room about a stranger who they share a common identity with. And I was just like, wow, this is crazy how this is happening. So it, was, it, was, it wasn't until August of last year when Kiki Fanshawe was killed here in our own backyard. She was murdered in Miami and, um, and she was a trans woman. And I said, okay, what can I do? You know, like I said, I've listened, I've empathized, I com I've had the compassion, but now what do I create to, to, to help push forward a narrative that could actually save a life? I am a really, I'm one of those crazy people who thinks that they can change the world. Uh, it's, it's both a gift and a curse. And I don't know why I decided to come in this form, <laughs> but I did and I'm here and I lean into it as much as I can. And so when that happened, I said, what can, as an educator, I've been an educator for 18 years I, and well, almost 20 years at this point. And I said, how can I educate people, use art and also tell stories? A lot of my work is really deeply embedded in storytelling. Uh, I just found that that was one of the most healing practices that I, that I started. That's why I speak. And, uh, and I just felt like we needed to do that. So, um, so that's what happened. I said, I want to create a docu-series that creates understanding about the trans experience and that the trans experience is actually on a spectrum. And it also has nothing to do with sexuality. It is, a, it is an gender identity. And so, and so I conceptualized this idea to do this docu-series that every season it would change and focus on different spectrums of the trans, of trans folks, of the trans experience. And I started with Black trans women uh, because Black trans women threw the rock that, that really ignited liberation for the LGBT community. So who better than them to usher in, but also because they were being killed at disproportionate, like just crazy. Right now, we have surpassed, almost doubled the amount of Black trans women that have been killed in 2020 than it was in 2019, which was at 26. Which mm -hmm. if you do a quick math, and I'm not a mathematician, I did this already, so don't think I'm doing this off the top of my head. But it's almost two trans women being killed a month. Imagine mm -hmm. losing two family members a month. That is a, that is a, a that's a pandemic. It's an epidemic mm -hmm. yeah. of a certain demographic. And I just felt like that needed to be uplifted, elevated, and somehow create some type of work that could 
stop that from happening. Right, right, absolutely. And I think for, um, for our exhibition, you know, showing episode six um, is, is such a strong fit because we see Brielle Roundtree, you know, participating in politics, participating in activism, um, and, and also the story of Elle Williams, um, which, you know, is really powerful. And, and for me, that was the story that I thought that this is the fit for the show because Elle is talking about leaving Miami um, and the sort of dynamics, the challenges of being in this particular city. Um, I do want to come back to talk about Elle um, and Transform. Uh, we're also going to share um, some other images uh, from the show right now, and Octavia is going to join me as we look at these images, um, and then we'll, we'll close out coming back to Octavia and specifically the project um, uh, Trans, Transform. Uh, these are two works. Transform. Um, the exhibition, uh, Wendy Red Stars, uh, Uppsala the Feminist, uh, is a body of work um, that she made, uh, taking, her, taking a picture of her and her daughter. Uh, here they are in an interior space, uh, sitting um, on a couch, um, and they have, they're surrounded uh, by Crow culture, um, garments, textiles. Uh, Crow um, culture is Wendy's culture. She grew up on a Crow reservation in Montana, um, which typically follows a matrilineal uh, process of society. Um, and so particularly in the case of Wendy, it is her grandmother um, and her family that have passed down many traditions to her that she passes to her daughter, B. B has been a collaborator from age seven uh, to 11. Um, and uh, has spoken also uh, at, at many museums. You know, I think that, um, you know, part of what Octavia was also making me think about just now when she was talking about transform is also thinking about how feminism um, needs to be inclusive, right? And I, I think that that is also um, part of uh, the impetus of Wendy Redstar's project, Apsalaka uh, Feminist. On the right, you have a work uh, by Ramiro Gomez. Uh, Ramiro is based in Los Angeles. He is the son of Mexican immigrants. Uh, he was working as a nanny in the Hollywood Hills. And at night, the kids would go to bed and he would start flipping through fashion magazines, um, home decor magazines. And he thought about, you know, where is the labor? Where is the work of the people in, in these houses? And so he takes the magazine interior scenes, as you see here, this beautiful scene focusing on abstract painting, and he paints in the labor, a woman cleaning the house um, that creates this pristine um, effect. He talks a lot about how, for him, it's important to make sure that uh, labor is visible um, and not uh, invisible, and it, it very much stems from his, his own family's experience. Uh, Octavia, um, we could go to the next slide. Um, I know um, that you're also a curator, you know, in the, in the case of me putting together um, this project showing Wendy's work and Ramiro's work. Um, these are artists that I have been familiar with with, with some time, for some time. Um, Octavia, are you often, you know, are you looking at lots of art and kind of filing away lists of artists that you want to work with uh, for your own curatorial projects? You know, um, <laughs> to be honest, no. And, I, and it's been a practice since I started, because I started, my entry into the art world was actually through choreography and dance. And I found that when I, as a young dancer, a choreo as a young choreographer, when I watched other people's work, my body would remember, because I'm self-adept. I'm self-adept in actually everything that I do. I've never been to school for anything that I do. Um, but I think that as humans, we need to really be in, well, way more in tune with our internal selves and know that we are everything. And we just need to tap into those things and, and lean into it and, cre and then share space with others, have conversations, and then let what comes out of us come, you know? So I don't. But I, when I came to Miami, it was, I watched, I did go to a lot of exhibitions and did watch a lot of artists, but I, I was less attached to the name of the artist and more attached to the feeling of the work. Mm -hmm. um, one of the people, and I don't know, and see, this is, I'm having this moment right now where I'm forgetting, but Lexis Bull, 
there we go. She was the first, one of the first artists that really impacted me when I came here, impacted me when I came here. She did this piece actually at, um, uh, uh, can, before Cannonball was called Cannonball. What was it called again? I don't know. Do you remember? Ah, oh, man. But anyways, uh, it was it was a gallery that was here and she did this performance artwork where she she came out wrapped in an American flag and she had made this community of 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 picks of little uh, icicle sticks. And she just walked around and she's beautiful. She's a beautiful, captivating woman. So she just walked around this town and her American flag wrapped around her shoulders and looking around. And then you just got captivated, but just like her strut, right? And just her energy. And then all of a sudden she started to stomp out the community. She started to stomp on all of those houses, all of those townhouses and buildings that she had made with these, with these icicle sticks. And one of the pieces flew at me like, Ugh, hit me in the face right and I caught it and I held on to that piece for a year and that right there showed me the power of performance art and it showed me the power of art and a practice in a, in a different way than choreography had and that is what that was my biggest influence um yeah, yeah. just people being who they are and just like getting it wrapped in the work and not in the artist mm. That's great. That's great. And um, I want to mention, since you bring up performance art, that on November 5th, uh, we will be having some spoken word and performances in the galleries um, that we'll be streaming um, on uh, Instagram Live uh, for, for those of you who are interested in seeing House to House activated um, in, in a different way. Uh, you're looking at two installation images here right now. We're really highlighting loan. Speaking of our local community, we were just talking about uh, local artists, Alexis Bull, but um, Alexis Bull rather, but um, also our local institutions like the Wolfsonian. I'm so grateful to my colleagues, Shoshana Reznikov, Amy Silverman, Kim Bergen, um, who were able to let us borrow a number of works, uh, including the stove that you see, um, also on the image on the left, um, you're looking at two prints, one by Norman Rockwell and on the right, a print by Alfred Palmer, uh, both from the, the Wolf's collection. Um, in the middle, we have kind of an intervention here where the feminist artist Martha Rosler um, from her, her work, Bringing the War Home Now. Um, it's a body of work in which she shows images of war uh, within the domestic space. Uh, so for me, um, when thinking through this exhibition, um, I thought that Martha Rosler provided a really interesting interesting juxtaposition with um, this World War II print uh, by Alfred Palmer on the right, and of course, this very sort of iconic home scene uh, by Norman Rockwell. We could go to the next slide. Amy, could I add something? Of course. Um, I wanted to add, because you did ask me about how I choose artists from a curatorial lens, and I don't, and I didn't answer that. And so the answer to that is um, I, I really, I, I watch people. I don't, and, and my energy always pulls me to, so a lot of the artists that I work with, you'll notice people haven't heard of them and it's because, or like not a lot of people have heard of them. And it's because I kind of sort of tap into artists way before they're to the level in which even maybe even an institution would look at them. So, and so, yeah, so that's, that's how I kind of operate. I watch it, I feel, and then my spirit says you, and then it happens. Well, I love that, Octavia, and I, and I think, you know, that's also important in my own curatorial work, and you'll find that in this exhibition, um, you know, established artists shown alongside emerging artists. Um, you know, I, I think it's also important to show artists that aren't represented by commercial galleries um, alongside artists that have had that um, sort of commercial recognition as, as well. Uh, we're looking at two photographs um, by uh, Leonard uh, Surya, Surya, sorry, Leonard, I know you're on the phone or uh, on the call, um, Leonard Surya Jaya. Um, and I, uh, Leonard's practice is one that I have known for a while. I got to see him speak at an art festival in San Diego a few years ago called Medium. Uh, he lives and works in Chicago. He uses a large format camera and he very much focuses on his family. Uh, the image on the left is of Leonard's sister, um, you know, a bedspread from home. She has slices of chicken on her face uh, and here she is taking um, a selfie. 
Um, Leonard has made a number of works uh, from his grad school days um, to the present uh, featuring uh, his sister. And she's also featured in the photograph on the right, um, which shows a group of women uh, in the lobby um, of Leonard's uh, parents' home uh, in Indonesia. Uh, this photograph was taken shortly after the Women's March that had taken place in D.C. in January in 2017. Uh, Leonard happened to be in Indonesia. Um, the lobby was decorated for Chinese New Year, and he said, you know, it was perfect for one of my, my tableaus. Um, but, but thinking about the Women's March and, and women gathering together and women uniting, um, the title of the piece, Arisan, refers to uh, gatherings um, of women in Indonesia. Um, perhaps they might bring food and share food together. And they share money as well. And they will give the money to different members um, of the Arisan that comes together. It's almost like a microloan uh, process. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I wanted to bring together lots of different voices um, in, in the exhibition. and and not be limited to one way of, of thinking about women uh, and in relationships to place um, and, and politics. We could go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, another detail of an image uh, in the show on the left by Deborah Willis. Um, it's actually a portrait um, of Carrie Mae Weems um, in Eatonville, uh, which is a community just north of uh, Orlando. Uh, I, will, I will plug, I think my colleagues will be happy, I will plug that Deb Willis will be joining us in October, October 17th um, at 3 p.m. to give our Green Critics Lecture, and I hope you'll come back and join us. Uh, Deb Willis is not only a photographer, uh, but she is a curator, a historian. Um, she won the MacArthur Fellowship a number of years ago. And a book that has been really important to me, and I think to many, is uh, her text, uh, Reflections in Black, which looks at the history of Black photographers. Um, and this image, I, you know, where we just finished installing the show, but I wanted to share with you the cube televisions uh, that are in the exhibition, uh, showing music videos. Uh, we have Shaka Khan, uh, Cindy Lauper, and this is a very grainy image of Janet Jackson, um, which Octavia, I was thinking about you as a choreographer, um, because this is uh, con the control video, which I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Paula Abdul was the choreographer and Mary Lambert uh, was um, the, the director. So, yeah, Amy, actually, that was that Janet Jackson and Paul Abdul is actually why I got into dance and choreography. I watched the Velvet Rope and self-taught my myself all the choreography. <laughs> I yeah. love it. I love it. I, I have to say, having this song in the galleries um, I has, has definitely made me really happy. And it's, it's a song that Janet Jackson was written um, when she was thinking about taking control of her own um, music career um, and sort of separating from, from the family. And it's sort of an anthem, um, I think, for, for young women. And uh, although now the song is a few decades old, it, it's still uh, incredibly relevant. Um, in the background, you also see uh, work by Carmen Lomas Garza um, and, and some dollhouses, uh, again, that were um, lent to us by the Andrews family. And we could go one more, one more slide. So here's a, another great uh, install image of the show um, and also two detail images um, of Elle Williams uh, from the Trans Forum, um, Octavia's uh, series that is represented in our exhibition. On the right, you see uh, Aurora Molina's Woven Destiny, which makes our, its debut uh, in, in our exhibition. Uh, 100 mandalas uh, connected to these three women uh, who are holding up signs in, in protest. It's another work in the exhibition that ties back to the women's marches that took place in, in 2017. Um, and in the background, you also see some other images, including a picture of Danica Rome, uh, who was the first trans woman to be elected in the U.S. to a state legislature. She was elected in the state of, of Virginia. 
Um, Octavia, as, as we start wrapping up, I, I wanted to, I shared sort of earlier that I felt uh, connected to Elle Williams and, and to her story um, in the Trans Forum. Uh, could you share a little bit about the process of working with Elle? Um, so Elle is very bold. She's very bold and, uh, and she's very, and she left, she didn't leave Miami. Mm. The process, we had about eight shooting days with the ladies. Um, and she was by far the rawest, rawest. Like, I mean, they were all pretty, pretty raw, but like, she was just no holds bar. She had nothing to keep her from telling her truth. So that was really wonderful and refreshing as well. And just open. She was very open about just like sharing everything that was going on in her world. Mm. It was great. I mean, all the, uh, all the women, but you know, it was, it was really, it was really amazing to work and watch all the women watch how Exaria was really focused on not not being pigeonholed about being a trans woman and watching Brielle completely lean into being a trans woman and advocating for trans women like in every way in on every day you know uh I think that it, the project would not have been what it was and the first season would not have been what it is without all of them simultaneously so uh, what, what made you connect most with Elle? I, I, in my opinion, y'all couldn't be more opposite in a way. But <laughs> Elle, yeah, because Elle, like, I'm going to read an, an excerpt from what Elle said that was a part of the first interview that, that we had with her just to see, we wanted to see how people were, would react to being in front of the camera. And she said, there are women with large clitorises there are, that are cis. There are women with... Uh, with 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 small uh, smaller titties than me that are cis there are women that have more facial hair coochie hair ass hair big burly arms who could knock me the f out who are cis so why do we have to be small frail and beautiful with big boobs and a big ass for me that's criticizing how women should look not all women have double d knocker porn boobies like i am a woman with no tits a penis and I'm effing beautiful. And that was the moment that I was like, what she says the world needs to hear, especially as it regards to women identity. But I'm curious, what makes, like I said, I, I wouldn't even think that y'all see, y'all couldn't be more different. So <laughs> what, what made you connect? Cause you know you more than I do, right? Yeah. Well, I love Octavia that you're turning the, the tables here. You've, you've become the one who's asking questions, but I like this. Um, you know, actually something you said at the very beginning really resonated with me as, as a curator. You said, you know, I, I'm interested in stories, um, narratives. You know, I, I am very interested in, in people's personal experiences, uh, what makes them who they are, um, their lived experiences, and how that shapes the decisions that they make. Um, anyone who can put themselves on the line and share a raw emotion or a personal story and, and be honest in a, in a public space, I think, I think it's really hard. And I really admire that. And I, as you know, I moved to Miami two and a half years ago. And I think part of what I connected with is, you know, Elle is very funny about Wynwood and, you know, talking about different neighborhoods, but also just like the challenges, you know, what are the challenges you know, for anyone to live in, in Miami and including black trans women. And I think that that was certainly something that I, I connected with. Um, well, Octavia, thank you so much for joining me uh, for this, uh, you know, conversation around the exhibition and around the, the trans forum. Um, I also want to share my gratitude to all of the artists in the exhibition. Um, those of you who joined us today, like Peggy, Rosemary, Leonard, um, and, and, and many others, especially, of course, Aurora Molina, um, and, and all the rest that joined us today, but also those who couldn't be here today and who lent so generously from their studios. Um, again, we thank our, our institutional lenders, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, the Wolfsonian, um, also Mocha North Miami, who generously gave, uh, lent rather, they definitely didn't give, generously lent those cube TVs that, that make the show very special. Um, I want to thank um, the, everyone who helped with the exhibition, 
but a special credit to Nicole Zambrano, an FIU student who was my intern this summer, and to Peggy Nolan, uh, who's in the show, but also helped really bring the show um, to, to its final fruition. My wonderful colleagues, uh, Carmen Carpio and Mariana Ramirez, who uh, worked on all the details of today. Um, and But don't go just yet, everyone, because we do have a special treat for you. Um, DJ Tracy Young uh, has recorded um, um, a special message for us. Uh, she apologizes that she couldn't be here in person uh, to join us today, um, but we're incredibly honored to have uh, a message from Grammy-winning DJ Tracy Young, and she will send us out this evening with uh, some of her music. Uh, thank you, everyone. This is DJ Tracy Young, and I am pleased to be a part of tonight's virtual opening for House to House, Women, Politics, and Place at the Frost Art Museum, FIU. Place at the Frost Art Museum, FIU. video for Madonna's Crave. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> 